back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. This week we are um, joined by a guest, Brian McGee. And Brian, you um, work with Salmon Safe. You're a biologist. Um, this show in particular is really about uh, a conservation movement and something that I'm passionate about is, is conservation itself. I know a lot of our listeners are, but again, you're a biologist out of the Northwest. Um, Salmon Safe supports that region in particular. We'll get into some of the details around what uh, uh, Salmon Safe is uh, beyond a, a scientifically based conservation program. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the history, uh, what you guys do, um, how you play, and then ultimately what your 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 goal is for Salmon Safe. And then we're going to wrap up the show with a handful of tips on how to get involved in um, in all of that uh, process and really take steps to um, you know help with the conservation aspect of, of uh, salmon, etc. However. You're also an angler. Uh, you're a fly fisherman at heart. So tell us a little bit about your angling experience, Brian, and uh, how that passion and your biology and et cetera led to Salmon Safe for you. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Christian. Uh, this is really exciting. It's it's not every day I get to just take a chunk out of my day and talk about fly fishing, of course, and the role that I do in, in my job, but it's just always nice to have that break in the day. And and yeah, I just, I, I'm really appreciative of that and you giving uh, me and my organization a platform to speak and be on your podcast. So thank you. Um, but yeah, just kind of going a little bit into to my background. Um, again, my name is Brian. I really like how you put a little bit of English on my last name, Maggie. It's Maggie, you know, either, either way, how you swing it. Um, but I grew up, I uh, grew up in Northern California. Uh, both of my paternal and maternal side have some pretty deep roots in state in Northern California. And so um felt like I had an interesting kind of bifurcated experience growing up of of visiting my mother's side in San Francisco um and kind of understanding how a city can affect wildlife uh as I was always as a kid just like wildly passionate about all things wildlife from birds to fish to lizards so I I, I had that experience visiting her family uh and then I would visit my father's family which is in the more uh, more rural areas outside of Sacramento and Redding California and and that was a little bit more uh, of a bigger introduction into like wildlife in general and kind of seeing some interesting species firsthand. And, and both of my uncles on my father's side were both very avid uh, fishermen and conservationists. So largely um, spending time with them in those regions of the Sierras, the Central Valley, mm. uh, Sierra Foothills, learning about wildlife, fishing for uh, all sorts of things was kind of my first introduction into angling. Um which was really fun. It definitely lit my spark. And, um, and then from there, I, I kind of took that passion and that interest, uh, and moved it forward into, you know, throughout high school and college. And I studied biology at Gonzaga university, just in Spokane, Washington, okay. and, uh, had a great time. Uh, I studied yellow bellied marmots for my, uh, research undergraduate research there. And if anyone is familiar with the city of Spokane, uh, you know, that, Come springtime, all the way through the summer, you will see your fair share of urban yellow-bellied marmots. Um, and so I, I did research on them in terms of if there were uh, differences between more urban marmots versus more rural marmots, and if they're actively selecting for different types of forage um, and that sort of thing, which was, I thought, pretty compelling and interesting research to be a part of. And yeah. and how that kind of merges into the fishing side of it was um, matriculating to Gonzaga was the first time that I kind of experienced a new bioregion for fishing. So I, you know, I, I rolled up and that was kind of the era where I really got into fly fishing was, was kind of my senior year of high school rolling into my freshman year at Gonzaga. Cause I kind of realized I was like, Oh my goodness, like I'm going to need to learn how to use a fly rod on all these blue ribbon rivers up here. Right. Um, which is great. And I, um, had a good experience doing that. My first fish I ever caught on a fly was in the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene River. It was a West Slope cutthroat uh, on a really, really chilly day in October, <laughs> late October. And I remember vividly that I didn't quite understand that I could just pull my line up to keep the line taut when I had the fish on. So I was actually trying to reel it in. And I remember my hands just not really being functional because of how cold <laughs> it was. Um, 
But if, if folks know what a West Slope cutthroat trout are, and I'm, I'm very sure there are people that do listening to this, um, you'll know that they're one of the most pretty, one of the prettiest mm-hmm. fish you'll probably ever see in the Selmonid family. And that's, that's saying something given how amazing that family is. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so that was kind of my first kind of baptism uh, into fly fishing was, was in those rivers and then also fishing in the Spokane River when I was a student. Um, there's also some really cool endemic species there. There's a, a red band rainbow trout, a subspecies yeah. of the rainbow trout that's endemic to that drainage, which um, population flies aren't doing great. Show talk about those red bands are beautiful yeah the red bands are awesome um yeah. there's actually if if folks are familiar there's a, a a spokane indians baseball team in town and their mascot is a is actually a cutthroat trout a, a red wow. excuse me a red band trout and its name you is ribby just adopt them right now hey i know i should <laughs> brought ribby on with me that would be great so uh i'm not a big mascot fan just personally i think they're scary i always have <laughs> and i don't think i'll ever change so but ribby can you know i i get along well with ribby because ribby, of what he's done for it, or she would or he or she or it stands for i should say but um so let's yeah jump just, back, though. Let, let's jump back yeah real quick. i really threw a lot at you christian yeah. so yeah that was just my, my little bit of my background you mentioned um this interest in biology in this like young age where do you think that came from uh i know where about Probably seventy percent of it came from, uh, and you might get a chuckle out of this, but it was it was actually probably Steve Irwin. Uh, both Steve Irwin and Jeff Corwin. Jeff Corwin had a show. He's another naturalist called the Jeff Corwin Experience, and so between really those two, um, that's pretty much where my interest started. And because he his show, I think it was the uh, Crocodile Diaries. It must have been. I am that might be a a slight difference in the name, but he would go to all these different regions, not just in Australia. I mean, globally, he would go around and he would bring so much energy into what he was doing in terms of talking about species and conservation. And and I really enjoyed how he would go to each of these different places and, um, and talk about it. And I just, to me, as at a very impressionable age, that was pretty, pretty unique. Um, Cause he and was I've always, super passionate. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. You can relate not saying... to kids, you know, like <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. What I loved about his shows uh, and his just general persona was, you could feel the love that he really had right. for the environment and animals and etc. Right. And he could translate that so well. I mean, that's why he was who he was. Um, yeah, but absolutely. It was in every element of it, you know. Yep. from environment uh, all the way through end of life of, of that, that animal and how it fell into the ecosystem. So that's right. really cool to hear, you know, someone of that era coming out. And I mean, I was a Jacques Cousteau guy, right? There you go. Very you similar. Know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like I wanted to explore and, and be an explorer and save, yeah. save the waters and, you know, 100%. All that stuff, right? Um, yeah, and Jeff Corwin had a great show too. The Jeff Corwin experience, I have to say, also was is similar, and he brought a lot of passion in as well. And yeah. there's the Crap Brothers, like Zabumafu is yeah, another yeah. one in in that era. Wild Crap, uh, right. Wild, That's I another, saw them. Another generation, yep. like my kids and stuff, grew up on, and oh yeah, they still talk about it. You know, like, yeah, oh, yeah. I so mean, cool. I'm just as I learn more about our general how humans interact in the world and how we view conservation, I am. I have really come to understand that like it is so vitally important to to teach young people about conservation about wildlife mm-hmm. because that you never know you could you could end up like me and be sitting here talking about how it drove you to become a conservationist do what I'm doing like there's you could definitely make a pretty direct argument of a direct line yeah. of me watching Steve Irwin <laughs> you know, chasing around Western fence lizards in my backyard uh, because of me wanting to emulate him, of course, not to like, you know, just yeah. to like, you know, just to investigate, right? Nothing, no malice there. And um, and then now, of course, like how that dovetailed into me studying biology, becoming a biologist. And then now, currently, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a biologist currently because I don't conduct active you know, research, I just have it as like a foundation that I pull upon um, having a really firm understanding of how biological systems work and applying it forward. Mine was all malice. I was, a, <laughs> <laughs> I was a kid boy 
you know, core to the core where if I yep. caught an animal, it was like, yeah, good luck, buddy. <laughs> right. Well, you uh, also I, learn I don't depending know why. on. <laughs> you also learn depending on where you are geographically and what you end up trying to catch out of out of right, pure right. curiosity. Sometimes that they don't want to be and they have sharp claws or teeth that you have to <laughs> account for. Luckily, I you know I didn't have too much of that. There was a friend of mine from college who. I remember this conversation really vividly and he was from an area of Alaska inside the Arctic circle. Um, and I remember just one of the first conversations we had, we were talking about wildlife cause I think he, he may have been at the time thinking about studying biology and he was like, yeah, you know, we have polar bears that are in my town. Like, we'll sh like sometimes the town will just have to shut down cause there's shut polar down. bears. And I was like, yeah, we, we didn't grow up in the same place. Did we? Like, <laughs> I, I grew up with raccoons and possums right. and you grew up with polar bears. Like we, we perhaps come from different places, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that could be said. I mean, if you grew up in the South, right. Or in areas yeah, or like that, you might have to deal with gators, right. Yeah, you I mean, grew up with a sustenance environment right, or, right. you know, you didn't, you know, mine was catching crawfish and making them fight, you know, poking right. them with hot sticks. Like that's what we yeah. did. We were boys, right. you know, it was like, oh, can we feed them a tadpole? Oh, maybe that'll happen. Oh. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. Well, I had lots of, lots and of you discovery from and that exploration. Too, right? Yeah, I mean, we were yes. in every pond and small stream and gutter, the the local creeks, you know, right. you would be down in, I mean, it was cesspools, right? Yeah. It's like, uh, but we waded around in them and caught all kinds of wildlife, learned about uh, all kinds of, um, uh, oh gosh, the name is slipping my mind, but the, um, oh, I can't even think of what are they, uh, the, the little lizards, the little water lizards. Uh, Oh yeah, we didn't have a ton of uh, water lizards where I grew up, but that's yeah, exciting. They were amphibious. I can't remember what they're called. Uh, amphibious, amphibians uh, or lizards? Or they were reptiles? amphibious uh, oh, reptiles. Reptiles. What the heck are they hmm. called? Um, I want to say salmon. Oh, gosh, slip in my mind. Anyway, we we would catch all kinds of stuff. Um, it was super fun. And we spent yeah. all our time down there. And that was part of, like you said, mine was exploration, right? Jacques Cousteau. Mm -hmm. So we would go down and we would explore all these creeks and areas. And we made homemade scuba masks so we could look under the water for crayfish and yep. you know, all kinds of stuff. So it was super cool to hear that correlation for you, too. Yeah, so I wish there was more amphibious reptiles where I grew up. Because, I mean, that talk about a unique, you know life strategy of a species right i mean you look at like the coral snakes you look at sea turtles i mean you look at snapping turtles alligators snapping turtles like it's just it's really interesting to think that like you know these reptiles that are are cold-blooded right like need to feel the heat in the sun yet they interact in the water like it's yeah. it's, it's interesting so yeah. i'm fascinated by those for sure yeah, it's pretty neat. pretty neat tell us a little bit about salmon safe the history um of the organization and and then we'll jump into, you know, what your mission is, et cetera. Yeah. So Sam and Safe is a nonprofit. We're based in Portland, Oregon. I'm currently based in Seattle. Uh, work across the entire region. And, and largely what we do as an organization is uh, we work with growers, farmers, uh, and other uh, landowners or land stewards in the, you know, both the urban and ag environment uh, to reduce watershed impacts. Uh, largely looking at watershed health through third-party independent assessment and verification. So 20 plus years ago, there was another nonprofit that there still currently is. It's called Pacific Rivers based in Oregon, much more policy and advocacy based as an organization. We actually spun out from them uh, as we began to work with more Oregon growers to try to find market incentives for enacting best management practices for watershed health on their lands. Um, and so from there, we started working in the Rogue River Valley with growers, moved up to the Willamette Valley of Oregon, um, and continued to cultivate a peer-reviewed document, peer-reviewed meaning that we had input from various university extension, other government agencies that are scientifically based in order to cultivate this best management practices for watershed health document. Mm. So we have, uh, it's called our Salmon Safe Farm Standards that we created out of that. And so what we'll do is we work with farmers. Uh, and we will assess their stewardship practices on this document. So um, that could look like, you know, I'll just I'll just mention 
what the key criteria is yeah. uh, on our farm standards. It's um, like a certification process, right? Right. That's. I'm just speaking about the beginning part of that certification okay. um, as we bring growers in. But yeah, essentially, like taking one step back is is that basically is what we're doing is we have this document. We work with growers who are interested in becoming assessed, and then we'll assess them on this core criteria, and then we'll also further support them on farm if they need it, whether that be connecting them to local resources to bolster conservation or another key component of what we do is working with growers directly to find retailers and other channel market access channels uh, to benefit them. So connecting them to local grocers, um, other outlets and brokers that want to continue to facilitate uh, like a more transparent supply chain regarding uh, sustainability and conservation. So uh, largely... Oh, Let me ahead. ask you this question, Brian. I worked with, and we had on the show, a merger strategies. Uh, and they have a, a very similar process in that they go through certification to get people to uh, a net zero carbon footprint. Right. My assumption is that Salmon Safe works in the similar nature in that you are here. The end goal, you're here. The end goal is here. It doesn't happen overnight. You work with these farmers, these landowners, et cetera, to get to a certain perspective, like you said, okay, first, I'm making some assumptions here. First, we're going to help you with fertilization and how to, you know, remove some of that and pesticides and blah, 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 and then, you know, drainage scenarios, whatever. And then we're going to work with you to also find the right people to sell to that are supportive in that nature. Is that a, a good assumption? that it's not an overnight scenario. It's something that you, you kind of work together with in a plan perspective. Yeah. I would say that we don't, we're, we're not in the consulting business. And I think that's the key difference between us and someone like an emerger strategy or another yeah. okay. environmental, uh, strategic, um, planner that helps with folks. Like we, we basically our our contribution with growers is here is this peer reviewed document for best management practices. They get assessed on it and then they, get we we communicate to the grower like oh there's a component of our standards that you can improve upon so say like as an example of that that could be how we address chemical usage and pesticide usage in our standards so we have as a part of our our key standards is we have a high hazard list of chemistries that through peer review hmm. and we know are deleterious for watershed health and so as a grower in our program you join our program and you phase those chemistries out gotcha. um so we don't like our role isn't to say don't use it's, this but use this instead like that's a pretty clear distinction of where we end our consulting so to speak but we still bring that that level of rigorous third-party independent based documents to say this here's is, the goal yeah. you guys right. self-govern it or go get right. consultancy from a third right. party that'll help you okay totally like it. Yeah. and then that's and then where we also help too is while that's ongoing um, that's where we can connect people with the market channels that are interested. But there, there is some direct connecting that I do. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily connect people to, um, like certain entities that might be a conflict of interest for us, right? But there are some things that I do of like, like say I'll connect a grower to their local conservation district or their local soil and water conservation district, or maybe another nonprofit that I know that's working in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that could be one. Like there's an example of uh, a few of our growers I've referred to uh, the Xerxes Society, which is another nonprofit working to bolster pollinators uh, across mm -hmm. working lands and, and other landscapes. And so, so yeah, that's an easy one for us to say, okay, yeah. well, as you continue to say, cultivate areas on your farm that you want to put into refugia or other habitat for native and beneficial insects, like, you know, here's a resource for you as well. But it's it's less so of like, don't use this this chemistry, but use this instead. It's a this is our high hazard list of chemistries. Please phase this out. Yeah. So okay, cool. Like yeah. That. Mission wise, um, can you give us a brief description of what you're really ultimately trying to accomplish? Right. You know. We are trying to accomplish healthy watersheds so specific so Pacific salmon can thrive. That's what we want to do. We want to promote and facilitate stewardship practices that enable salmon and other endemic salmonids to survive in these waterways. Yeah. Okay. And, and if you could help us as an audience understand the importance of that, I think we all know it's important 
and have some general ideas of of why it may be important. Um, but if you could kind of give us some scientific um, back evidence or scientific explanation of look, this is how it plays into the ecosystem sure fantastic yeah well i'm i'm really hoping that much of your listeners will, will already implicitly know that saving watersheds is the key to their their core passions um but yeah i mean just in general if you look across you know our our region i'll take our our region as an example the columbia basin which is you know 285 million square acres i know it's it's quite large that might yeah. be it's larger than the country of france i know that so i might have got the metric a little bit off but so to give it into context it's a giant drainage right and so as we progress further into the 21st century here and we have data at our fingertips looking at some of these projections around what our climate will look like how how much our temperature is going to increase how those increases and those instabilities in temperature will affect wildlife. Like we, we know it's not going to be good, especially when you talk about species like salmonids, like endemic salmonids that need cold water, cold and clean water. Um, so as we, as we know, and as we're projecting these data, it's, it's, it's really not looking good. And, and that I think is, is a really key and core understanding is to why everyone should care about this sort of work and to ensure that our watersheds are are clean and cold and um, healthy, right? Because that don't, not only affects salmon, but that also affects humans, right? Like there will be more drought pressures across the world, you know, not just the West Coast that we that we work in. Um, and those affect humans too. They sure as hell also affect salmon and trout. So... Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that's just, that doesn't necessarily, uh, a direct, um, I don't have like a, a, a resource to say like, this is exactly, you know, this, this is just general research that, that is being compiled by, by scientists throughout academia that know this, but, but one that would be more scientifically, um, you know, uh, keyed upon here, um, uh, is the emergence of a new chemical compound, uh, called 6PPD. So in December of 2020, the Washington State University, after years of research in association with a couple other groups like NOAA, uh, finally isolated a compound that they found to be extremely harmful to salmon, in particular coho salmon. And what it is, is essentially it's the tire dust that comes off of your tire when it reacts into the ozone. So like if you slam on your brakes skid on the road or just general wear and tear on your tire that chemical which is actually used as an anti-cracking and, and a, a increased um, life it's supposed to prolong the life of a tire by delaying the cracking and degradation process but that compound they finally isolated it after seeing these co salmon basically die upon immediate freshwater you know change from their anadromy um, and so that that's new and that's it's terrible, right? Like, yeah. uh, and so as we learn, so there's been a big time focus throughout, you know, government agencies at all levels and other groups to really try to address and understand like, okay, well, what can we do about six PPD? There are tires everywhere, you know? And so there's a pretty big push right now to, to, to look at green infrastructure, right? Which is a component of what our organization does, not just on the ag side. We also work in the green environment to promote uh, stormwater remediation. So like that is a, a big time focus on the, on the urban side for us. Um, and yeah, I think, I think there needs to be uh, further action from, from other agencies too. And of course, like the tire industry is um, certainly needs to play a role moving forward in terms of finding a different chemistry that can be used in its place, which I know is ongoing. Um, but just as an example of how, you know, how humans interact within a watershed uh, that kind of binds us all, so to speak, is the six PPD issue. You know, yeah. I mean, whether you take a bike, take take a flight, drive a car, you know, I mean, there's there's tires there's everywhere. Tires. So, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, in a sense, it's almost like a an opportunity for us to kind of unify together across the watershed and say, yeah, I mean, this is this is something we need to address. So, yeah. hmm. that is really interesting. And like I, you said, it's so. Uh, binding in nature because it is it's everybody, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah, really correlates. Yeah, and and when I 
by the way, just to go back to something I said about the temperature warming up, the IPCC would be a great place to start in terms of learning uh, information about climate change. So, so there is, of course, a component to that. I just wanted yeah. to make that that clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And I think the resources, you know, this is education, right? That's why we right. get guys like you on the show is just, just kind of share. I think if we all learn just a little bit, um, it's helpful right. and just to yeah. in that awareness realm. There's a lot of negatives floating around when you work in conservation, I'll say. Like when, when the 6PPD issue came up, it's like, oh my goodness, we were like, we, we just were trying to get a handle on some of these other chemicals that we know are long lasting in our environment. Here's another one. And so, so yeah, it is easy to kind of maybe fall into like a, I won't say despair, but just kind of like, oh, well, we're all kind of screwed. But, but I, I kind of view it and I think it's really uh, important for a listener to kind of view it through and listen to it through the lens of like, there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to come together and, and as a consumer become more educated, you know, maybe become more involved in your watershed too. Like there's, there's definitely opportunity there. So yeah. I, I view it with an active foot forward. Well, and I think it's a lot like uh, the process that we described that you, you guys utilize with landowners, et cetera. It's, it's not an all or none. Uh, right. scenario rarely is i mean it's not like we're going to shut this off come you know, tomorrow or within a couple of years it's just it's not realistic but right. a percentage change over thousands of inputs millions of inputs is a significant change and if we can work towards that it's making change right? i guess definitely is the way that i look at it um yeah the more acres under certification the more that that these sorts of practices are being implemented on land. I mean, that, that attains critical mass into a watershed or a specific yeah. smaller watershed within a larger watershed. And that can make a difference. And that's, that's what we are. What main goal of our program is to do. So. And I remember reading uh, on the website, something like it was like a hundred thousand acres are under your certification already. So, I mean, it's yeah, pretty across, significant. Yeah. Yeah. Across the entire region. Yeah. And that's, yeah, definitely uh, a lot of interest in, interest in increasing that. Um, that we're we are keen to do, of course, but also that we're kind of getting with with partners and other landowners. So that should that is definitely increasing. But the more the merrier. So, so as a landowner, what what is their vested interest in in getting certified and uh, and working with Sam and Say? If you were a landowner, could you give that perspective? Well, yeah, and it's also probably good for me to make the distinction. Our program is voluntary, and it's mm -hmm. non-regulatory, right? Like, there are no penalties for being in our program or if someone, if we are working with a grower and we, you know, there's just, that's not how we operate. We're all voluntary and keep things confidential, of course, like when we do farm assessments and that sort of thing. But, but yeah, so if you're a landowner, there's there's definitely a spectrum of folks that I work with, of, of folks that are wanting to join our program because they in, just inherently want to do so perhaps they're anglers perhaps they just really like salmon or they just are really passionate about attaining certification which is great those are fantastic growers to work with largely those growers um are already doing so many fantastic and net positive things on their land from a stewardship perspective but but then there are other growers that it it is you know, a different and a, a bit more of a, a process to begin to transition their acreage to more watershed friendly practices. And so, you know, I think with any decision at a larger scale that it takes more research and planning, like there is a little bit more of a desire to see that that be a benefit in the market. And that's, you know, we've known that since day one as the organization. And so that's why we, we do a lot of work with retail outlets. So, so grocery chains and I think I mentioned that I work a little bit with the hop industry. Maybe I haven't quite yet, but we do work with a lot of hop growers, given that we started in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, uh, which is one of the major hop growing regions in our country. Um, so we have a lot of really great relationships in the hop industry um, now throughout all the regions of the hop growing regions of the Pacific Northwest and, and also now has led us to have some really great relationships with breweries. And so, so a lot of my work is to continue to show value. Um, to our hop growers being in our program by building this coalition of breweries that are really interested in sourcing salmon safe hops um, from a grower to gr grower to brewery through a broker to brewery. I mean, there's just 
a lot of work that we've done and continually have been doing to promote that. And so that really helps to to kind of have that market access and that work in hand when we work with new hop growers to say like, hey, this is really a a train that is is going pretty fast down the tracks. Um, and we'd we'd really like to continue to see it move. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are other transition industries too. in the in the marijuana space as well. I mean that region um, there's a lot of growers up there too. Are they adopting the programs? Like you, uh, you bring up a great question. Uh, we have not to date worked directly with any marijuana growers, um, largely because we just haven't made that decision given the federal uh, laws around it. Right, um, right. But you bring up a great point in terms of, you know, there's most certainly is a need uh, to have that sort of third party independent verification. Um, as someone that spent a lot of time in Northern California as a kid and in, in these areas of Mendocino County, like I very much can tell you firsthand, uh, when unregulated, uh, those growing operations are just about as bad as it gets from a wildlife and water quality <laughs> perspective. So, so it's, a, it's an industry that ho- hopefully if the laws change, we'd love to work more in. And I, I really think there could be a benefit, but as it stands now, uh, we have, but, yeah, cause it's, I, I would assume it's a little problematic in the fact that they're just gobbling up acreage like crazy. Right. It's such a profitable uh, space or uh, et cetera. So it's, it's only going to continue to, to grow in, in a multitude of regions. And early yeah. adoption, I would think, would be you know the best step. I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I definitely would love to uh, help see that tr- those transitions and be supportive of it. But uh Sadly, just, you know, at least from my perspective of want, knowing that there's a need and I just think uh, we're not we're not quite there yet as an organization yep. to be able to throw our support behind it. So. Well, you know, as an organization, yeah. you're bound by certain rules, that, uh, you know, our federal rules, like you said, not state level. Uh, right. There's, there's all kinds of different. Uh, scenarios. Totally. Yep. And, and you like like we said before, it's percentages right so right if you're focusing on the percentage you have the most effect on right now and uh you know as that uh, comes to fruition in other areas you, you work on that so yep absolutely so ultimately let, let's let's talk about what what salmon safe does really right you know ultimately it's helping to clear uh for clear and cold water scenarios right Right. Is that the way you would describe it? Yeah. We are working to help facilitate the transition to better best management practices for watershed health through our salmon safe certification program. So as a grower, we connect, you say, I'd like to be in your program. What we will do is we will take a, a independent third party assessor that we contract out to do on farm assessments. We'll connect them with the grower. And then, as I mentioned, as a part of our standards, in-stream habitat protection, I'll, I'll just read, just list off our core elements for the for the viewers. And our, our standards are online. They're just on our website, so you can reference them. They're open Which source. Which is salmonsafe.org. Correct. Right? Yeah, Salmon under Get Certified. Okay. Yeah. So we look at the core certification standards are in-stream habitat protection and restoration, riparian and wetland vegetation protection and restoration, water use management, erosion protection, IPM and water quality protection, so integrated pest management, Mm -hmm. uh, animal management, if there are animals, uh, and landscape level biodiversity enhancement. So those are the three or the seven criteria in which we look at to build essentially what is climate resiliency on working lands. And I Mm -hmm. think that is such an imperative uh, thing to continue to build, as I mentioned before, regarding our climate becoming uh, generally hotter and more inconsistent as we progress further into the century. Yeah, and I think the, the key element that I pulled out of that was working lands, right? Right. It's not just uh, agricultural farming lands, but it's working lands. So, right. Like you have, you know, herds of cattle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those all have an effect on the watershed um, and pretty significant. So, it's really interesting to see that diversity as well. Right. Absolutely. And there is a lot of, um, there's some other spaces that we work with as well. I mean, to a lesser degree, we do work with golf courses as a part of our urban standard too. And, um, but, but yeah, I mean, to your point as well, like there are, there are definitely some, some impacts on the watershed that we all really need to be cognizant of. And, Mm -hmm. and the grazing world, um, I think is a really interesting point for so long, of course, like have, you know, cattle have been very unfriendly to 
to the watershed in a lot of places around the world, they still mm -hmm. are. I mean, you look at what has currently been happening and happening in the Amazon, you oh, know, yeah. over the past few years to a lesser degree, thankfully under Lula to Silva's new administration, but under the Bolsonaro administration, I mean, there's just, I think it was like 85 million acres of trees got clear cut in a pretty small amount of time. And, you know, how does, how do, how does that affect a watershed when you mm -hmm. take out old growth forests? Not great. I mean, no. that's just terrible. So, so yeah, I mean, I think cows, uh, you know, rightly so have gotten quite a bad rap in terms of their watershed uh, when they are mismanaged from a grazing perspective. Like I think, you know, rightfully so um, we all need to be better about that. But on the same time, we, we do work with some livestock producers. There are a couple of cattle producers that we work with that are just um, honest to God have just been fantastic regarding ensuring that riparian areas are perfect are protected that rotational grazing practices are being adhered to and um and really trying to look at how cattle grazing from a soil health perspective can can be a benefit and i think there's some really promising data to come out of that and yeah i don't i, I think there's there's still more research of course that needs to be done say you know how does how does that work on land with cattle and rotational grazing affect watershed health which it, it, it seems when done well can be pretty a, a, a positive benefit and mm -hmm. and then looking at other things like what other emissions are, are tied up in that in terms of like if you're doing that with your cattle but then sending them to a feedlot for the last however many months of their life like you know we we certainly haven't ever certified a feedlot i don't think we ever plan to from a watershed salmon safe perspective because <laughs> just just flat out most of them are, are pretty bad from a water quality perspective so so you know if you are grazing cattle and doing that and then sending them to a feedlot, you know, how, how much of that is good from an environmental footprint perspective. Yeah. So again, I'm not, not necessarily picking on, on the livestock industry. Cause I, again, we work with growers that do yeah. some really, really fantastic things, but it's just, there needs to be more data. And there's a lot of applied research going into that very same thing pertaining to livestock grazing. So it's, it should be uh, some really, really interesting research coming out in the next few years about it. For sure. Very cool. Very cool. Let's, let's do this. Let's jump into the last section of the show, and that's going to be um, how people take take some action. But before we do that, earlier in the show, I was hung up on the name of that amphibious uh, animal, and, it, and they're salamanders. Oh, my gosh. Very right. nice. Right, salamanders. Uh, right. We used to catch salamanders, man. That was like the golden prize. The, the right. Animal. Which are amphibians, so I would have got it if you said they were amphibians, not reptiles. But yes, yeah. no, those are cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really. I mean, the region. You know, I, I've heard so much from a fishing perspective about brook trout in some of those regions outside of Western Pennsylvania and and the, and I guess Central Pennsylvania too. So I I would be really curious and keen to go investigate that further. Um, I fished the I fished last year in. God, it was in June of last year. I was on a trip to DC, but we made it up to uh, Appalachia and fished out of Virginia for some brook trout. And that was actually the first time I think I'd caught native brook trout in my life, um, which is cool. Uh, yeah. You know, if you if you're into that sort of thing, I thought it was cool. So it is. It's uh, that blue lining in Virginia, West Virginia, can be yeah. incredible. The warm waters of West Virginia are yeah are amazing. Geez. The cold water. You just go through that region; it's so untapped in in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but it was the central... hottest I'd ever fished before. It was unbelievably, oppressively humid. So yeah, and the canopy I don't know how you... of yeah of uh, bushes in all kinds of ways. It's, it's right. be really unique and beautiful. Um, right. If you haven't fished Pennsylvania, um, it's highly underrated. Yeah, uh, that's what I've heard. It's incredible. The fish yeah. are absolutely incredible. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. Go, go to Central Pennsylvania and explore some of that stuff up by State College, and that I mean, you just your mind will be blown. It's yeah, incredible fisheries. Absolutely. Well, maybe when Salmon Safe eventually gets further outside of our our current region, which we don't necessarily have plans to do so in the next few years, but you know, as we work into areas, I mean, this that's a good. I guess that's a good point to bring up in terms of like we work specifically right now in the Pacific Northwest, right in the interior Columbia basin. But it's not to say that this sort of like independent third party assessment of best management practices for watershed health can't be applied to other areas of the mm -hmm. country because they are all very uniform in the sense that all of those criteria, those core certification standards apply everywhere. 
right? Like mm-hmm. wherever you are in the country, you know, that you have to look out for, you know, in-stream habitat, riparian areas, water use management, of course, like animal management, IPM, like it's all, it's all very translatable. So yeah. like a place like the, the Chesapeake watershed, as an example, like I know that is quite the beast of a watershed that could have, you know, definitely needs to, to have some, some, <laughs> yeah. some help, so to speak. And I know a lot of organizations are doing great work into doing just that, right. but like, yeah, I mean, talk about a giant watershed on the East coast that, you know, has salmonids in the upper reaches of it, right. With the brook trout, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah. Universal so. application in a lot of ways. Sure. Right. And that's where we have, um, kind of in that same vein, we have another program that we just recently launched called our trout safe program. And so largely we are utilizing that program. It's our same farm standards, uh, same core farm standards, uh, that we're applying just to upper reaches of the Columbia basin that don't have salmon, uh, to continue to provide that benefit to growers, like that market based, uh, incentive to growers, but, you know, just in areas that, you know, either historically or for whatever current reason don't have salmon in them. So, mm-hmm. okay, cool. so as a, as a listener today, take away, how could they get involved and, and maybe take some action uh, regarding salmon safe or just the, the policies or the uh, clean and clear water scenario? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so happy that your audience is tuning in because they already are, are, familiar to varying spectrums of watershed health, as I've said. So that's just fantastic. But, but yeah, I mean, as, as a, as a interested party, I would say, feel free to visit our website at salmonsafe.org just to learn a little bit more about what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, But depending on where you are in the world, I mean, if you are in the Pacific Northwest, if you're in the Mountain West, if you're in the South, if you're in the Southeast, if you're in the Northeast, you know, just speaking about our, our continent, so to speak. Uh, I would say look look into resources like who's doing conservation work locally. I mean, that's always a great way to educate yourself um, to see what other nonprofits and, and what they're doing and learn about some of the action they're taking and get just trying to get involved. I mean, that's always a fun, fun way of doing so. I mean, there's always Earth Day activities um, mm-hmm. across the country, I see. So, like, you know, if you just want to get your feet wet, volunteering on an Earth Day event could be fun. Uh, but in terms of supporting Salmon Safe, further i guess um specifically on our end as i mentioned we do a lot of that market connection so with retailers uh and that sort of thing and so if you are in a region that we work in you know the portland seattle spokane boise uh places like that bend like we do a lot of work with with grocery but we also do a lot of work with beer uh, breweries and distilleries so if you do fancy yourself beer um, particularly if you're looking for beer to bring on a fishing wait, trip, wait, wait. if you're Time curious, out. yeah, Time go out. ahead. Everybody's listening. You can drink <laughs> beer and do good for your rivers. <laughs> yes. Save right. salmon, drink beer is what we've, uh, kind of landed on our slogan. That's a bit of an oversimplification <laughs> of, of everything in terms of salmon and recovery, but yes, because we do work with so many hop growers in our program and now by extension of that breweries, but also with other grain growers too. Uh, we work to help facilitate more and more uh, brewery support. So, yeah, I mean, we work with some really, really awesome partners. I mean, there's a whole list that you can find on our website. But, you know, if you're in Portland, you know, Hopworks Brewing is a great one. Migration Brewing also does a lot of support in Portland. And they've got their Willamette Valley hop growers just south of them. And then then in Seattle, you've got, you know, Georgetown Brewing, which is which is great. They do some cyclical salmon safe releases as well. And Aslan Brewing up in Bellingham, you know, in Spokane, you've got a couple other breweries like Brick West Brewing and Whistle Punk Brewing and some of those breweries that support really locally uh, grown conservation focused grains, because that is really the grain region of our state is that Palouse area and, you know, right in kind of where Spokane is. Um, and, so there's some great breweries there. you just go to the there. website, I'm just kind of, while you were talking, I went to the website, salmonsafe.org. You go to buy salmon and say, I mean, there's vineyards, there's all kinds of different yes. things. But the the brewing, I'm just looking at right now, 10 barrel brewing, the shoots brewing, Fremont brewing, full sale, Hopworks, Urban Brewing, New Belgium, Red Rock, Sierra Nevada, Widmer Brothers. I mean, you, there are tons of brewers right. on here. This is amazing. And well, I'll make the distinction, Christian, that not every single beer that these breweries come out with is salmon safe. These are just breweries that we have worked with over the years that have made a, a effort to at least highlight our 
a beer with certified salmon safe yeah. hops or grain. But there are breweries on here, of course, that do a really good job of not just highlighting a single one off beer, but also work to incorporate salmon safe messaging throughout like more of their core lineup. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's great to have some really, I'll say heavy hitters, so to speak, in the yep. brewery world that are interested. And you even have whiskey. Uh, let's see here. Copper Works is a whiskey um, uh, manufacturer. Or Indeed. The distillery is what they call yeah, them the in the biz. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there's a few other ones that we're just kind of working in our infancy on. Um, but Copper Works, they're Seattle based. They're they're really keen on sourcing uh, almost exclusively Pacific Northwest and Washington grown grains, in particular grains that are salmon safe certified. So, yeah, that would be that would be a great option. They were actually our first uh, distillery to come out with a salmon safe beer. And so that was that was really fun. And uh, that got when that came out, I think, last December, or the de December before last. I mean, there was all sorts of media that 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 was picked up by and all sorts of like you name the whiskey drinking reference fishing reference like it was it was written about so that's cool um, so that was really cool so yeah if you fancy yourself a whiskey fan copper works uh does a lot of uh really awesome work in terms of like ensuring their sourcing is uh, and there sustainable. was a, a, uh, a plethora of wine um, yeah, and I'd be remiss to not mention more on the wine side. Uh, that was as we worked in the Rogue River Valley and then up to the Willamette Valley. The Willamette Valley, of course, also has a ton of vineyards. And so mm -hmm. they, the wine industry in general has been uh, really friendly to us. And we work with a lot of vineyard owners and, and yeah. managers. And there's another nonprofit we work with um, in Oregon called Live Certified. And they uh, work as well to implement our program as their as they work specifically in the wine industry. And so we actually have a, an overlay partnership with them in which their, their certification looks a, a bit more encompassing above, not just environmental stewardship, but also, you know, how is a as a vineyard or how is a winery, you know, you function, are you being equitable and, and, and other sorts of criteria that, that go beyond our certification. And so, you know, between our partnership, it's really nice that, you know, they work with wineries or they work with wineries and vineyards. We just ensure that the environmental stewardship side is robust for them. And it's, it's been a really successful partnership. We do that with a couple other organizations that I should mention. Uh, Oregon Tilt is an organic certifier that we have an overlay certification with for growers. So you can get mm -hmm. certified okay. basically at the same time as your organic certification. Ours is on a three-year cycle versus theirs on a one-year. A couple other Global Gap is another one, and then uh, Food Alliance is another one that we have a similar partnership with. But, wow, man, you've really educated us a lot uh, today on this Salmon Safe program, and uh, appreciate that quite a bit. It's like I said, near and dear to my heart. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, I think you, regardless of wherever you're at, what region, you know, try and get involved. Um, it's you know in all of our best interests, I think, to do that. Um, correlate that back to our early conversation of where your passion came from and some of my passion came from and that's in our early adolescence and impressionism so you know maybe find somebody uh, of that age that could help you um, and, and, uh, or go with you on your volunteer day so uh, again Brian it was great having you on the call uh, I highly recommend uh, you guys just to go check out cmnc.org um, recognition tell your friends etc and uh let's get out there and enjoy our waters and continue to enjoy them for years to come thanks again brian and uh, we'll see all of you next time